Bethany here, and he's praying. And I want to kind of put this into context here. <clears throat> Jesus knows what's going to happen. He's going into the garden to pray. He knows he's going to be crucified. He knows he's going to die upon the cross. He knows what's going to happen in the tomb. He knows he's going to rise victorious. And yet, he takes the time in the garden to pray to his father. Even though he knows the outcome. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows who's going to betray him. He knows what his disciples are going to do and what they're not going to do. But yet he takes the time to go and pray to the Father. In the book of Luke, Luke tells us that Jesus prayed with such an intensity, such fervor, that his sweat became like drops of blood. Luke 22, starting at verse 42. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in great agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. That's how hard, how earnestly the word tells us he was praying to the Father for himself, right? Well, he prayed for his ministry, yes. Yes. But Jesus at this point is battling the principal, principalities of evil like we have never seen. So I, I, I love the verse there where he says, if it is your will, take this cup from me. And I've often wondered, what, what is Jesus referring to? And, 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 and some commentaries will tell you that the cup is a symbol of God's wrath on all the sin of all humanity. And Jesus knows he has to take of this cup. He has to take the sin. He has to take the punishment for every sin that ever is committed, ever to be committed. And he's fully God, yet he has to take this upon himself. And he's like, God, I don't really want to do that, but, but I'll do it for you. I'll do it for the generations to come. So he's praying. He knows rejection is coming. He knows betrayal is coming. He knows that the cross of Calvary looms before him the very next day. Yet he prays. He prayed for his people, for his disciples. And he prayed for every person who would ever believe in him. Verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, referring to the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He prayed for you and for me. He prayed 2,000 plus years down the road for those who would listen to the disciples' message, who would listen and read the word of God and understand that it is the truth and the truth is what sets us free and when we live that life in him we don't have to worry about the wrath of God to come because that cup was taken by our Savior Lord Jesus Christ what an incredible picture he paints for us so who is Jesus we've gone all the way through the book of John here we're, we're getting towards the end and we've seen him as the word of God, the son of man, the, the, the miracle worker, the great physician. We've seen him in all sorts of different lights. Now we see him as the great high priest who goes directly to the throne room of God. And because we have this person who opened up the throne to us by his death, the word tells us later on, we'll read, where the veil of the temple was torn in two when he cried out, it is finished. So no longer do we have to go into the most holy of holies through the blood of sacrificed lambs, goats, and bulls, and only the priest can go in. We can go in directly because of him. He is our great high priest. And he prayed, not necessarily just for his ministry. He prayed for you and for me. And so the first thing I want to look at is that he prays for your heart. He prayed for the heart of the people. And he says now in verse 11, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. He's praying 
for these disciples. He's praying for those that are yet to come. He's headed to the cross. He knows he's going to die. He knows he's going to be raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. And he's leaving his disciples. And he wants to pray for them. He's praying for his disciples to carry on the work that he started with his earthly ministry here. And then he prays about you and me. Again, 2,000 plus years down the road, he saw every one of you sitting here today, and he says, Father, if it's your will, let this cup pass. But if it's not, I'll, I'll take of that cup because I see Dan sitting in the church. I see Brad. I see Carla. I see Delmer. I'll pray. For, I'll, I'll do it for them. He prays for us. He prays for our eternal security. Verse 12 goes on. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now he's talking about Judas here. He knew exactly what Judas was going to do. And so Judas was the one he's talking about here. But he's headed to the cross. He knows what's going to happen and he prays about the glory of the Father. He prays that we will have eternal security in Him when we believe in Him. He tells us that right there. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them, none of them is lost. That's our Father. That's what He's praying about. Earlier in John 10, Verse 28, he says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. He was very consistent on this point, that when you follow him and you believe in him, he, you are his forever and ever, and no one is going to take you from him. I want you to stop and think about this. If we serve a God that says every single day, you have to prove to me that you're worthy of being saved. You, every single day, you have to keep yourself saved and serve God at the same time. And every day, you have to re-approach the throne. And you say, well, this is what I did for you yesterday. This, these, these are my works. And every single day, we are constantly trying to prove ourselves to God. That's not what the Word tells us. The word tells us when we believe in Jesus Christ, you're saved. Believe and you will be saved, you and all your household, Paul writes in Romans. This is what we're talking about when he was talking to the Roman centurion. If you believe in him and you apply the principles of Jesus Christ into your heart and your life, you are going to be different. You are going to be changed because we are his. We are his forever and ever and ever. So he prays about your security. And then we'll go on to verse 13. It says, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. He prays for our contentment. He prays that we will be content here on earth. He prays for his people, his disciples, his followers to experience joy in life. And we've talked about this before. There is a difference between joy and happiness because happiness is something that is dependent upon circumstances. It's dependent upon the world around you, the things going on around you. But joy is not dependent on circumstances. Joy is rooted and dependent upon God and the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives. And when you have Jesus Christ in your heart and your life, and you have the Holy Spirit working in your heart and your life, you can be joyful during those trials and tribulations. When the roof goes flying off in a derecho storm, right? You know, it, it, it's a trial and tribulation, and you can say, well, I'm not very happy. No, we weren't happy when the storm hit. But we could keep our joy because our joy is rooted in God. Our joy is rooted in, in, in the eternal security of Jesus Christ. It was, you know, the boys and I were taking, we um, got a skittle that was making weird noises. We were taking it down to Pella on Friday to get it worked on. And about halfway there, I hear the tires start to blow. Just made this weird noise. And so here we are with a skid loader in the back of the trailer and everything. And I'm like, well, 
it is what it is. I mean, I couldn't get mad. I kind of laughed about it. And my whole hope really was that somebody would steal the truck, the trailer, and the skid loader, but nobody did. <laughs> well, I was just like, I mean, happy? No, I wasn't happy. But joyful? Yes, because in the grand scheme of the thing, it was a blown tire. That was it. And so my joy is not found in the worldly possessions. My joy is not found in, in, in the world telling me what makes me happy. My joy is found in Christ. See, the world is all about happiness. The world is all about buy this, try this, do this, and you will truly be happy for three easy installments. You will truly be happy. Whatever it might be, you can find it, and it will make you truly happy. But Jesus promises us joy, true contentment, joy, joy in Jesus Christ will allow you to be content when the doctor says you've got cancer, when it's all throughout your body. Joy will allow you to be content in that situation. Joy lets you praise him when a loved one passes who knows Christ because you know that that person it's far better off today than they were here on earth. True joy lets you stare adversity in the face and have a peace like you've never known before. No matter how scared you might be, you have joy knowing that no matter what the outcome is, He is there and He will be glorified. That's joy. Because joy has absolutely nothing to do with happiness, but has everything in the world to do with contentment. And contentment, true contentment, is absolutely priceless. You cannot put a price on it. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. That's what we look for. That's the contentment that we want. The joy that we want in our hearts and our lives. Then he goes on in verse 14. And he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He's praying for his disciples to be different. He's praying that you would keep them from the worldly influences that are around them. Even back 2,000 years ago, this was a problem. Now, they didn't have infomercials, they didn't have internet and cell phones and everything else, but they still had the worldly influences of the day, just like you and I do. So he prays for his people that they will be kept from the influence, the corrupt influence of the world and of the devil. He wants us to be different from the world around us. He says right there in verse 15 that you should keep them from the evil one. Keep them from looking like the world around them. Keep them so they are different and set apart. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 6.17 Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. We are to be different. We are to look different. We are to talk different, walk different, act different from the world. They should look at us and know that God has touched our hearts and our lives. See, everything that we do, everything in this life should be filtered through the lens of Christ's desire that we be separate from the world around us. See, Christ provided everything that we need to be different. He provided everything that we need to be victorious in this battle of being different from the world around us. And he's promised us an ability to win over temptation. We know exactly what we need to do. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Right? We, we, we know this. We, we know that there's nothing new under the sun. It's the same temptations that have been happening for thousands of years. Maybe on a little bit faster scale now with the technology that we have. He goes on to say, But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, every time I read this, I always focus in on the last half of the verse where it says, He will make the way. 
Why did he write the way? Why did Paul write it down that way? Why didn't he say he will provide a way? He will provide a door? Because Jesus told us the answer to this right here when he was here on earth in John 14, 6. I am what? The way. There's your answer. He's going to provide you the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is our escape clause from this temptation that ha happens around us. He, he's given us the tools and the skills that we need. And sometimes, myself included, we're just weak and broken and beat up and we cave. We just look at the temptation and go, you know what? I can't do it anymore. Whatever. I can't fight this anymore. What if Christ had said that? What if Christ in the garden, instead of saying, Father, if it's your will, let this cut pass from me. And he said, you know what, God? I, I'm fed up with these people. They're hard-headed. They're obnoxious. They don't listen to me. They, they, they never hear what I'm going to say. They don't get it. I'm done. I'm finished with them. No. He provides the way of escape. He gives us, he promised us the ability to win over temptation and the tempter. James, Jesus' half-brother, writes this in 4 and 7. He says, therefore, submit to God. Okay? So we're His. We believe in Him. We've submitted our lives. We've given everything over to Him. Resist the devil. So we go back to the way. We read His Word. We apply the Word. We study the Word. And then James tells us, and the devil will flee. He will flee from you. It's that simple. See, Christ wants us to be different. He was praying to his Father that you and I would be different from the world around us. So how does it happen? Verse 17 goes on. He says, sanctify. Sanctify them by your truth, for your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Sanctification, a process that we go through to be um, to holy and made clean before God. When something is sanctified, it is set apart for a specific purpose. And this purpose right here is to glorify God in all that we do. So we're set apart. And he wants us, Jesus wants us to be set, set, set aside and purified and used for God's glory. And so many times, so many of us, again, I, we, we all do this. I, I do it too. We forget what the Word of God says or we ignore what the Word of God says. And we, we choose to set ourselves aside for something that we want, that we want to do, that we think is important. But as you spend time in the Word of God, it begins to expose those areas of your life. Because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we look into the Word, remember, he was the Word. He is the Word. He was here at the very foundation of the world. But he begins to expose those areas in our lives that need attention, that need change, that need a touch from the Master. When we hear the word, we read that word, and we apply it to our lives. So we, we, we get into scripture, we study it, we write down our thoughts, and we say, wow, God, I am that man. And just as David said, I am guilty before you. What do we do? How do we handle that? When you do that, when you begin to apply the Word of God to your heart and to your life, you're going to become cleaner, spiritually speaking, and of greater use to God. Because you are a vessel now that has been sanctified, set apart for God's purpose. Paul writes this in 2 Timothy 2, 20-21. He says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor. Here's the key. Sanctified and useful for the master, prepared 
for every good work. See, that needs to be us today. We need to be going into the house and saying, God, what honors you? What are the vessels today that honor you or dishonor you? What needs to be removed? And then sanctify me, Lord. Sanctify me by your word, for your word is truth. Because the fact of the matter is, some of us are honorable. We do this. We've read the word. We apply the word. It's a daily battle in our hearts and our lives. And, and we ask God to cleanse us and to sanctify us and use us for his glory. But there's others out there who don't. Their vessels are dirty. The vessels are unclean. And they can't be used for God's glory. The word of God, what he left us with right here is that cleansing ministry that prepares us, each and every one of us, to be used by the hand of God for His glory. It's not for the glory of Newberg Chester. It's not for the glory of Matt Olson or anyone else. Everything we do here is for one purpose, and that is for the glory of God, the advancement of the gospel. That's why we're here. And so he prays about your heart and then he prays about your commission we go on in verse 20 he says I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may be all be that all may be one as father you are in me and I in you that they may also may be in us that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they be one just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire, I desire, Lord, that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Did you catch that, that last part there? I desire, I desire that they whom you gave me may be with me where I am. It's Christ's desire that we are together as one. To be with him, we have to be as one. He wants us to walk in unity within the body. And we have to maintain that unity within the body. He's praying that we walk in one with him. And that's a tough thing to do. Because there, there's several of us here today. And I guarantee if we pick a topic, we can split the church right down the middle. And you'll have people over here who believe this. People over here who believe this. That's okay. As long as we can go back to Scripture and not find anything that is scripturally unsound in those beliefs, it's okay that we disagree. We need to learn as a church, as a body, when you join that body, to be disagreeable at times with one another. And not hold it against a fellow brother or sister. Because there's going to be things that we don't all agree upon. Because then we'd all be a bunch of mind-numbed robots and that'd be no fun. God loves variety. He loves the differences in his children. Paul writes this in Philippians 2, starting at verse 2. Fulfilling my joy of being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but that also for the interests of others. See, Paul's telling us, he says, you know, you're not going to agree. But when you see that person that you don't agree with, think of them higher than you. Think of how you can serve them. Think of how you can show them the glory of God in your life and what you're doing. This is why unity is so important in the church. If we can't get along in the church... Jesus understood this. If the body is constantly fighting with one another, within the body, when we do those things, the people of the world will either see God in the church or they're going to see the world in the church. 
And see, you might be the only Jesus that people ever see. And if they go, well, I'm not going to go to that church because so-and-so goes to that church. Let me tell you how they act. Let me tell you what they say at work. Let me tell you what they do outside of those church doors. See, we are those sanctified and set-apart vessels that bring glory to God. And we have to be different in order to be those vessels that he talks about. And so he prays for us. He prays for our job, our commission, as we go out into the world, that we will be different and people will be able to see him in everything that we do. Verse 25 goes on. It says, Oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them. And I in them. See, he wants us to be in love with one another. Now, we say that in the terms of today's society, and we go, oh, that's so gross. You know, I don't, no, we're not talking about a physical love. We're talking about that agape love that says, I love my brother and sister in Christ so much, I will do anything. I will even die for them. I will lay down my life for them. That's the love he's talking about. He prayed that we would be filled with that love. See, we are be, to be known by this love. This is what's going to set us apart. That is our love for one another. And Jesus said this, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another in John 13. You notice he didn't say, If you wear this specific uniform and dress a certain way, and talk a certain way, or if you go and get this certain tattoo on your body somewhere that everybody can see, then that will set you apart, and everybody will know you're my disciples. Or, or if you wear a certain type of jewelry or headdress. No, he said one simple thing. Probably the hardest thing to do in the world is to love one another, and more importantly, to love your enemies as your brother. It would have been a whole lot easier if he said, hey, Here's the uniform you are when you sign up. But he didn't. He told us to love one another. Love one another. And then if you notice in verse 24, Jesus is praying about our eternity with him. He says, you gave, um, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am and that they may behold my glory which you have given me. See, he's praying. He, he wants us in heaven with him. He wants us to be there with him. He declared that it is his will that his people will be with him in his heavenly home. What an incredible prayer this is. The Greek word for desire here is philo. And it's used to um, describe the will of God which is unalterable and firmly fixed. On something. So that's what Jesus is saying here. It is the will of God, and that will will come to pass. That's what he's praying. In essence, he's saying, I'm declaring that it is my purpose that everyone who receives me will be with me in heaven and will behold my glory. That was the prayer for you and for me, for his disciples, and generation after generation after generation. If you know Christ, you're going home. If you know Christ, you believe in Him, and you serve Him, you're going home. You're going to be with Him in eternity. And we need to live our lives, our lives in the light and the truth of this, in the truth of an eternity in heaven with Christ. You know, so many people, we talk about end times, we talk about prophecy, we, we talk about all these things, but the truth of the matter is, Jesus Christ said, I am coming back for my bride, I am coming back for my church, and as a body, as believers in Christ, we need to apply that to our hearts and our lives. We need to understand that we need to sanctify our vessels and be prepared for Christ when he comes back, because he's coming back. I'm so grateful that Jesus Christ paid the price that he did and that he is the great high priest and that he took time in the garden to pray for us before he went to the cross to die. 
Because everything that we just read here today of this prayer, it still impacts you. It still impacts me today. And God's words, Christ's words, his prayers are always heard. They're always answered. John 11, starting verse 41, says, Then he took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by this, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. See, he hears. He always hears. He answers prayers. Now, the thing is, he might not always answer the prayers the way we want them answered. We have to remember that. Yes, no, not now. You know, most of us in here have, have children or had children. Yes, no, maybe. Maybe really means no, right? Kids know that. But not now. God says, I'm not, you're, you're not ready for that. But he will answer our prayers. So the question that remains today, are his prayers that he prayed in that garden, are they being fulfilled in your life and the life of the church here today? Is Newburgh Chester, are, are, are those prayers being fulfilled? First thing we have to ask ourselves, are you truly saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you believed in him and said, yes, Lord, I want you to be master of my life and I want to follow you in all that I do because God wants that relationship with you. He's given you every opportunity to accept that relationship to you. And if you don't, it's not a pretty picture. If you don't accept it, the day will come when you take your last breath and you will be immediately ushered in to an eternity completely separated from God in hell. That's not what he wants. Peter wrote this, 2 Peter 3.9, that he is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That all should come to repentance. Second, do we have unity in the church? Do we truly have unity within the church? That's God's desire for us. That was Christ's desire as he prayed in the garden. 1 Peter 3 says this, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this that you may inherit a blessing. We're to love one another and bless one another. That's the unity within the church. So are you saved? Is there unity in the church? And then my last one, are you truly walking in the love of Christ? Walking in love to one another as we should. Because this was his prayer for us. He wanted us to be unified, yes. And he wanted us to love one another. Mark 12 says this, Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this. We know this, we've heard this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, for there is no other commandment greater than these. Love God, love your neighbor. We're all neighbors. It doesn't matter if you're within the church, outside the church walls. It doesn't matter if they live next door, down the street, or across the state, wherever it is. We are to love one another. That's what we've been called to do. He prayed this for us. That's our great high priest. And it's hard. If we turn the camera around right now and showed the congregation, I had you raise your hand. How many of you have somebody in your life that is hard to love? There wouldn't be one hand down. We all have those people in our lives, but that's exactly what we're called to do. Because he did the hard thing. He loved the unlovable. That's us. And he prayed to the Father that his will would become our will and that we would follow this prayer. And so I'm so thankful that Christ is our, high, our high, great high priest. I'm so thankful that he goes into the throne room for us, that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for each and every one of us today. And so 
as we close, has the Holy Spirit touched your heart today? Has God revealed things in your heart and your life that need to be addressed, that need to be changed? If He has, I beg you today, I'm begging you to come to Him right where you sit. You don't have to come to an altar. You don't have to make a spectacle of yourself. But right where you sit... Open up your heart to Him. Open up your life to Him and say, Father, I, I want you to sanctify me by your truth. I want you to make me pure and holy and useful again for you. Because if you do, and you let Him have His way in your heart and your life right now, I'm going to guarantee you, your life will never, ever be changed. Or will ne never be the same again because you're going to be changed like never before. Your life will be completely and totally different because you're serving Him. You're sanctified for Him, not for your own purposes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to share your word today. And Lord, I pray that if there be anybody within the sound of my voice here or on online who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the acceptable day of salvation. And Father, I pray that you would just work in our hearts and our lives. Help us to cleanse our lives before you, to offer over our vessels so that you can sanctify them by your word and make us holy and pure and clean and useful again. Lord, thank you for Newbert Chester. I thank you for this body and the love that they show for one another, that they show for the world around them. Continue, Father, to use this body and this congregation as that lighthouse, that beacon of hope in a dark and dying generation. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.